Welcome, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ, and welcome to The Spirit of EQ podcast. Life is a journey. Spirit of EQ helps shape and guide the road ahead for individuals, leaders, teams, and organizations striving to realize their full potential through emotional intelligence. Spirit of EQ is a coaching and consulting company that assists individuals and businesses to reach their full potential by developing emotional intelligence. In business, managers and leaders recognize the value of training to develop leadership skills. What they may not realize is that those skills are far more effective when they pay attention to not only performance, but also to people. Emotional intelligence is a crucial skill because people drive performance and emotions drive people. Today we have a very special guest, Bill O'Haran, LCSW. And joining me as always is Jeff East with the Spirit of EQ. Hi, Jeff. How are you? Hey, Eric. And hi, Bill. Hey, guys. Thank you so much. You are welcome, Bill. Um, as I always tell most of our guests, I have this wonderful art of butchering names, butchering titles, butchering biographies. So I'm doing everything I can these days to let uh, our guests kind of speak for themselves. So before we get into our conversation that I'm so looking forward to, and Jeff as well, uh, can you tell our audience a little bit about your background? And if you want to include titles and designations sure. and all that stuff, please. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep. Uh, so I am, um, I've been in the financial field for off and on for 33 years. So I'm a senior executive uh, in the capital raising space. Um, I'm also an LCSW, a licensed clinical social worker with an evenings and weekend practice, um, you know, in service to folks that, you know, want to learn, you know, understand why they're feeling what they're feeling. I've had my license for 14 years. Um, like I said, I've been in the financial field since Reagan's second term in office, 1986. And in general, I'm a mid 50 year old seeker of truth and uh, love these conversations. And I'm really, really appreciative of you guys and, and really just, just appreciate the opportunity to share thoughts and exchange ideas. And Bill, we do appreciate that. And that was the one of the things, besides the fact that we've got some New Jersey commonality, <laughs> in the house. right? Uh, I, I so appreciated our conversation that we had off air some time ago and just getting an idea about your story and journey. Um, kind of want to take uh, right there. You know, you mentioned that your your counseling work, um, um, you, you primarily focus on relationships. Am I correct in that? That tends to be the foundation. Yep. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. So w what does that look like? Because I think about relationships, you know, mother, daughter, husband, wife, partner, partner, whatever it may be. Is there any specific area that you find yourself in more than another? I, I think a lot. Well, I don't think a lot in the last kind of four to five years has been um, the marital area. I mean, I did write mm -hmm. the book, uh, came out last year called Waking Up Marriage. We'll probably get to that a little bit later, but it's, yeah. it's not really the writing of the book that, or the book coming out is the important thing is I decided, so marriage happens to be the, the zone where I do spend a lot of time, but when you, mm -hmm. when you peel it back or raise up a little bit, look at the really the macro, macro issue, what, what the word relationship means, Eric, mm -hmm. it comes from Latin carry back. And so we are in relationship with every single thing that we encounter, whether it's the checkout person, whether it's the guy cutting you off, <laughs> whether it's your sister, your mother, your boss, but really we're in relationship with ourselves. And that sounds very new agey and kind of like, um, you know, super holistic. But if you boil it all down, it's, it's our emotions and our reaction to the world are really the only things that we can control. Somebody said this to me 12 years ago, Bill, what's the one thing in the, in the planet, one thing in the world that you can control? And I was coming up with all these things and he said, all we can control is how we feel. That's it. And if we can't control anything else, what I realized, Eric, is that the relationships I was in, whether it was my boss or my parents, were kicking up all these feelings and sensibilities inside of me. So mm. I decided, you know what? I'm going to use my marriage and I'm going to use my interaction with my boss, my friends as the template, as the arena to work on Bill. Because if I can't change it or manage anything else, then why am I spending all this energy blaming, you know, you know, all these things we do to project out where's really the work is inside. So mm. it's really for me, it's relationship with Bill is me. That's where I start and try to end. And I've been at it for a long time and I realize 
I think I've just begun. Like, yeah. and, and I think that's been the big insight. You know, I'm 56 and I've been meditating for 25 years and I've been a therapist for 14 years and I've been married for 24 years. And, you know, I wake up in the morning going, there's so much stuff I still don't know about me and I want to figure it out. That's great. I, you know, as you were mentioning there, the relationship with self, and, and I want to talk a little bit uh, here in a moment or two about uh, the role that those emotions play in how we mm. look at ourselves, right? But would you say that in that journey, as long as it has been, and as difficult a work as it is to do, would you say it's been rewarding? And in what way? Oh, God. Oh, man. What a great, what a great question. And I was just having a conversation. I was at PT for my knee and I was just having a conversation with this 22 year old, um, you know, just graduated from college mm -hmm. um, talking about the challenges. He's like, you know, the challenge of our emotions. I said, yeah, it's challenging because we have stuff inside. So the answer to the question is it's changed everything. It, I, I wouldn't still be married. Um, you know, it, my health, my ability to see the world and, and intuit the world and feel into the world um and happiness you know i tear up just thinking you know if i hadn't done the work mm. I, it, it would have been you know it's been a bumpy ride it's always a bumpy ride being human is a bumpy ride it's a beautiful ride it's the only ride in town um but doing the work on self is really i feel like it's, it keeps me, it keeps me engaged and I want to complete this life. Robert Monroe says the reason why we come here, Eric, is that we take everything from our non-physical self, our emotional self, that which lives in our limbic body, our heart and belly. We take, we're here to take all this stuff and put it out into the material world. And how do we know what to put out into the material world unless we know the content of this non-physical stuff, these emotions, these sensibilities, these feelings. And I realized that dance is the dance of life and when i'm not doing it i don't feel whole and when i am doing it i feel like ah i'm on my mission and so yes to answer the long-winded answer is mm. it's been a phenomenal phenomenal exercise and it's just begun on a lot of levels well jeff and i have spoken about this many times uh probably some on the podcast and some just in our overall mm. conversations about the the value in putting in the work um, and the results that come from it. And, you know, I think about my, my, my life experience and you and I shared this, uh, with one another, uh, before yeah. Bill about, you know, the days in corporate America, the, the climbing and the achieving and the acquiring and all of that. Mm. And I think about, well, I think on the face of it, yeah, I wanted to have some self-knowledge, have some idea about why I, how I tick. But there was a lot of the stuff that I thought, well, I, I don't really want to go there. I'll just, <laughs> I, I'll, I'll just keep achieving and then that'll make everything okay. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. And of course, uh, at least for me, uh, I had that Solomon moment. And I think you and I talked about that, yep. you know, where you, you reach that place where you're going, wait a minute, is this it? Yeah. Every, everyone around me is telling me that this should be the greatest thing ever. Yeah. And I can't fight the boredom and the frustration and the, yeah. it's just blah. Yeah. And that turn. Yeah, but, so did you, when you look back over time and, and I'm sure all of us had many points of awakening, but was there an awakening that you'd like mm. to share that you can mm. look back on and go, that was a catalyst moment. That was a Rubicon moment. Yes. And, and just listening to your talk about, you know, the corporate world. So I was living in London. I'm 31 at the time for this back in the mid nineties, 30, 31, 32. What I like to say is living the life of Riley. Right. So I was working at an investment bank, mm -hmm. you know, living downtown London, traveling, skiing, and something wasn't right inside. Everything was right on the outside. Something wasn't right. I know, again, that sounds new agey, you know, nowadays, like, Oh, you know, the financial guy, you know, sees, goes to the mountaintop and changes everything. Well, there was no mountaintop. There was just me at home by myself. And my heart, it felt like my heart was shrinking. It's like physic physically, it felt like there was something 
draining inside of me and I couldn't put a name to it. I went to, I was dating a girl. She's like, you're insecure. You should go to a therapist. I'm like, screw you. I'm from New Jersey. I'll white knuckle it. I'll figure it out. <laughs> I, ended, I, ended, I ended up going to a therapist. Um, and she asked me the first session, Eric, she asked me this. So this is 1996. Mm -hmm. She asked me this question. She said, Bill, you're asking some deep questions. Are you sure you want to go there? And I said, well, I, I, I don't know where else to go here. And she says, well, if you do this, she said, if you, and she said this, she said, have you ever seen the movie, uh, lost Raiders of the lost Ark when he's standing on the edge and the standing on the edge of the abyss and there's nothing there. And he puts his foot out and this beam of white light becomes his bridge. She's like, that's where you're standing now. You have no idea what this is going to open up. And I looked at it with this first tear. I hadn't shed a tear in 15 years. I looked at it. I said, well, it can't be any worse than how I feel right now. And she said, oh yes, it can. And I went home that night and I'm like, I don't know what it is, but I can't keep doing it this way. Mm. This it is not working. And then another friend, female said, you should meditate. And I said, once again, I'm like, I'm white knuckle. Nobody's going to meditate here. I'm a Jersey boy. Well, sure enough, three weeks later, Eric, I meditated. I sat one night with my back straight in my third floor walk up, Dracop Place in London. And I, and I, I started to weep with no content. The tears just flowed out as if somebody had opened up a dam with no content. I'm 32 years old and I pass out. I passed out from the first time I ever meditated. And I came to, and I heard these words. I heard, welcome back. Hmm. And since that day, I have heard a whisper and a chant and something inside from that non-physical space that keeps tapping me on the shoulder. Hmm. And so a year later, I moved to Venezuela. I put myself in storage. I had a bunch of money in the bank. And I've been journeying ever since, you know, 25 years of journey. And, and I'm still trying to figure it out. But wow. yes, that was a denouement moment. And what I tell yeah. people is it found me. I, it wasn't like, oh, you're super brave. You did it. You know, you quit your job. I was at Salmon Brothers at the time. And I was working on a trading desk, the largest trading floor in Europe. And I told my boss I was going to quit. He's like, can you just give me another month? And people were coming up to me, strangers in this huge trading floor, tapping me on the shoulder saying, Bill, I heard you're the one quitting. I heard you're the one traveling to Venezuela. I heard, I'm like, yeah. She's like, oh, my God, tell me about it. And they're like, you're so brave. You're so courageous. And I'm looking at him going, if they knew how not brave I felt, <laughs> right. I just had to get out. I had It found me. And it's still trying to, it's still trying to draw me wherever, wherever it's going. Wow. You know, it's um, interesting uh, in the number of guests that we've had on and the uniqueness of the journey uh, and the power of, there's commonality mm. in it too, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So when you, when you think about that, um, you know, when you had that moment, did you, did you spend any time trying to like reject that that voice at all <laughs> oh yeah and i'm speaking from experience that yes i oh, have yeah. <laughs> yes sir yes sir i kept saying this is this is going to go away it's going to wash away in fact i had this really good medical doctor dr walsh mm -hmm. and he's like ah you're just going through that first kind of little mini you know you're in your 30s you made a bunch of money and you don't you know you achieved your physical goals your material goals and so you're you know you're just going to get to that next physical goal achieve materializing goal seeking stage and i kept waiting you know every week i'm like you know this this too will pass and it just kept growing and i kept reading i would read my first book was a path with heart jack cornfield and i'd get to the end of that book got to the end of that book and i'm like oh what other books did jack read in order to write this book about spirituality and and holism and and approaching your life differently and i suddenly got hooked because eric the reason something got hooked is that when i would when i would do the cathartic work whether it was therapy or meditation i would tear up and these old emotions would wash through me and it was difficult there was the challenge right burning in the fire of self you know, as Jung says, you got to go into the cave. And as, and as, and as um, um, Joseph Campbell says, it's like out in the great loneliness, where you seek and find self. And so it'd be hard. And then I'd be done. And this wave of joy and this wave of it's okay and connectivity was like, a, it was like drinking an alcohol or drinking an elixir that I'd never drunk before. It was a sense of peace. Hmm. And it was that, you know, that sense of peace. I'd wake up in the morning, I'd put my suit on, I'd grind it out, I'd come home, I'd put my sweats on, and I'd be seeking that place of peace. 
and I and I tried letting go of it. And it just I couldn't let go of it. Wow. Uh, you know, when you first started talking, Bill, there's there's something you said about new age, mm. and I almost look at what you're talking about as old age. Oh, <laughs> boy, oh boy, did you nail it! And and the reason I think that is in in our age, we do not allow time for that old age stuff. Mm. Um, so h- how would you help someone? give the old age stuff time i mean what you said is really the crux of my the next part of the journey i'm working on a a a course a college level course called the called the intuition project and it looks back at the last two hundred thousand years of human beings um doing this you know every every spiritual faith every religion you know the word religion comes from lagar which means to bind Mm -hmm. Um, spiritus the word spiritus comes from latin to breathe Mm -hmm. um yoga means the union the binding the binding of the non-physical and the physical in whatever terms and 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 whatever whatever gods or whatever singular symbolic energetic forces archetypes we embrace it's all good everything is everything is the same it's the seeking of knowledge of self so that we can understand who we are in this place. And you nailed it. It's so old age. It's so ancient. The challenges over the years, cultures and societies and, and associations have put their own version, their, their male, their, their human context over an ancient practice. And the ancient practice is Bill sitting on a cushion, Eric sitting on a cushion, going into your prayer, going into prayers, talking to God, meditations, listening to God. And it's that's that it's that dance. And if we do that, we will find our way through the journey. And whatever whatever context we want to put on it, Yahweh, Abraham, um, you know, name them, you know, all the Hindu gods, all that stuff are just symbols to get to that place of un of knowing self, knowing our sadness and longing and joy, and putting it out to the world. It is so old. But the new age is gone is basically putting labels on and say, you got to do it this way and you got to eat this food and you got to do this this yoga practice. And it's all good. Right. But each day I get older, I just realize it's all the same thing. And you nailed it. It's a beautiful topic. So I come to you and you tell me what you just said. So what would be the first thing you would tell me to do Mm -hmm. to start doing that old age stuff? Just the first thing. Well, um, I hate to hate to be a broken record, and my wife says I'm incapable of small talk, and don't get Bill talking about sitting quietly. But the first <laughs> thing, the first thing I would do, and I do it in, I have two counseling clients tonight. Uh, one's brand new, one's a, a, a one that's been, and what we, the first thing we do is we close our eyes, we straighten our spine, tree of life, we straighten it, straighten our spine. We close our eyes and we do some very light breathing and we just listen to our heart. Mm. So it's close your eyes back straight, breathe into the solar plexus. When you breathe into the solar plexus, the largest ganglia of nerves, it starts to, it it sends signals up to the heart, sends signals to the midbrain to relax. You go into um, the parasympathetic mode where your body starts to relax. Now you're going from beta brain waves to alpha brain waves. Well, guess what? The universe, the ionosphere, the tree, the squirrels, all their brain, all the cells, all the electrons are at seven to 10 cycles. They're at alpha. So we leave the beta world, this rationalized adult world thinking, got to solve things. We relax and we listen to the heart. Well, why would we listen to the heart? Oh, the heart's got 40,000 brain neurons in it. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Say that again? Yeah. <laughs> the heart has 40,000 brain on neurons. It's the intelligence of the body. It's the intelligence of what you want. What do you want in your life? Who are you? Where are you going? Well, I don't know those answers. Okay, perfect. Sit and pray, talk, and then sit and listen. Listen. Listen to listen to the universe talk to you through your heart. Mm-hmm. You slow down. And everything will become clearer the more you sit quietly. It's the ancient practice, 250,000 years. It's the home of EQ. It's where the left brain and the right brain start to merge. It's a physiological, biophysical reactive state physiological state of sitting quietly for seven minutes that starts the process and now you're in the game what's Mm. the game intuition self-knowledge aware now here's the problem here comes the warning huge disclaimer all capitalized in bold 
if you sit quietly, you will have a memory that is sad. There will be sadness, there will be longing, and you will remember your grandfather who passed away and you really miss him and you're gonna weep like a baby, period. That will happen, guarantee, and that's why people don't do it. Mm. And a part of them knows it. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Do you know what, uh, Bill, and uh, this is the part where I probably should cue Brett to do the public service announcement because I think I've gotten in trouble for this before, but <laughs> <laughs> no sense in uh, stopping the, the train. Um, yeah. So I, I have come from it, and I think we talked about this when we first uh, met. You know, I'm a Christ follower. Mm -hmm. uh, however, I, I kind of liken it to that's my foundation. That's where I, everything emanates from. Yep. Once I get past the foundation, I'm an artist. So I want to yeah. try colors of lavender with blue and green, and mm. I want to be on canvas, but then maybe not. Maybe it's a sketch. So I find value in all different types of wisdom and all kinds of different approaches to, to get to that place where it strengthens my foundation, right? Yep. So I don't have to tell you, and Jeff and I have talked about it just one-on-one -on -one offline, that you know, in some forms of America, and it's not just the evangelical world, mm. it's, it can be another religion where they have a very tight, yes. tight view. Yeah. It's almost like, well, before we get started, you need to answer these 20 questions. And if I don't get the right answer for those 20 questions, then I'm not going to do it. Yeah. So I still have a heart and a burden for those folks because I'm saying, you, nobody's advocating that you give up your foundation but we're yeah. just talking about understanding more about you as a human being that this person walking the planet i don't know have you ever encountered someone who maybe and i think the word is probably fundamentalist that's probably yeah. the one that comes to mind have you ever i mean have you encountered anyone in that fundamentalist realm <laughs> and how did you handle that uh, so i'm in texas <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. You're in Texas. <laughs> I'm in Texas. Yep. So we moved from Connecticut, non fundamental, no fundamentalists up there, to Texas. Um, and I had, it's a great, uh, so yes, and I'll give you a very specific example, mm -hmm. uh, a very specific uh, uh, anecdote to what you're saying, a story. Um, and by the way, Jesus is the great, the, the great of greats. I mean, if you look at how the Hindus, what they believe, and that he, you know, was the one that came back to, to try to wake the world up. I mean, he is Krishna consciousness. Jesus is the man. Jesus and Mary are like, you know, anyway. Um, and there's this great book called The Yoga of Jesus. It's actually, it's a powerful, powerful book. And so mm -hmm. I'm having this conversation with this nice young gentleman at my office two years ago mm -hmm. in Austin. And we're talking to him and he's like, he's talking about, you know, fundamental Christian. And I'm like, I love it. It's great. You know, you know, Jesus was the man I've got, I've been reading, you know, I've been studying this for 20, 20 years, sir. I've been studying and it's great. And it's so beautiful. And he did this and this is me talking. And he's like, well, you should come down. You should come down. I'm like, I would love to come down and talk to you guys. I just want to ask you one question. If I believe that he is incredible avatar, the greatest of the greats, nobody greater, but I also, you know, um, I, I chant to the Native Americans and I feel connected to all these other kind of spirits and archetypes. And so I'm not grounded in one singular symbolic force. Would that be an issue? He's like, yeah, that would be an issue. And I said, are you sure? Like, I just want to talk about life and how it goes and where you guys are going and how we can add value to the community. He's like, if you don't believe, then I'm sorry. We, I, I, you know, he was super sweet. Yeah. And I walked out of that. It was right in front of the bathroom, right? Because that's where I have all my great conversations. In Europe. <laughs> and I had my, my heart was saddened for a moment. And it, it, not sad, like, I just, I want to connect and I want to be part of the greater good. And yeah, so the answer is yes. It, it's, it, it's, a, it's an if or then, you know, and, and I, I look at it as, you know, the universe is, is an inclusive space, right? The tree doesn't care what bird lands on it. It just wants to be landed on. <laughs> and so I believe inclusive, being inclusive is the MO, is the modus operandum of the human experience. And so it's a challenge, but I embrace it. And I, and I, and I, I respect people's deep, deep faith. Yeah, that gotcha, I do. Gotcha. With, you know, I, I am in the same tribe as Eric as far as my beliefs. Mm. But also, I agree with what you're saying. Um, 
this is kind of a commercial, but that's not what it's for. <laughs> uh, Spirit of EQ, the company that, that Eric and I are partners in, have developed something called a spiritual emotional intelligence. And it's a profile, and we're working on moving it to a full assessment. But what is very interesting is the most resistance we've had to that are the fundamentalist Christian. Yeah. Because yeah. it doesn't talk about Jesus, yeah. <laughs> I think, is the biggest yeah. thing. And it's it's designed to not have a religious bent. It's all about mm. connection. Yeah. And and people I think are missing out on strengthening that connection with whoever is their higher power. And see, I have to be careful, uh, Bill, because it starts to pull at me to be the wisecrack when I encounter some of this. Because I because <laughs> when I encounter that that approach, I kind of go, so you've you've ripped out the book of Esther out of your Bible, right? And it'll, it is like, well, what do you mean? Well, you realize that God is not mentioned in that book at all. At zero <laughs> as in wow. nothing, right? And again, and I, I want to say this for the audience as well, listeners, uh, this is not my call to like, I'm trying to poke. All right. I, yeah. I, I'm going at it from the angle that, I don't believe you have to check your foundational beliefs at the door. Mm. Mm. I think well put. it can be your curiosity to learn and to listen. And quite frankly, if I could go back and have some time back deposited into my account, it would mm. be those times when I said, no, nah, I don't need to. No, I don't need yeah. to listen. No, I don't need to hear. <laughs> because I might have gotten some information, even from someone who I may be diametrically opposed, opposed. to, totally. yeah, that would my change yeah. my life. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, the, yeah. That's so beautiful because as you guys were speaking, the word that kept like a, like a neon sign was curiosity, curiosity, mm, Yes, you know, and, and I look at mother earth and I look at nature and I look at, you know, is the tree curious that, you know, look at the tree, watch that, that thing is that, that, entity is so curious because it keeps reaching it never stops reaching i keep trimming my trees in my, around my house so i get it, my view and they keep coming at it right the squirrel is keep it like we're part of this web and if we lose the curiosity and we get hooked on one platform in one spot i feel like it's okay not for me i have to keep pushing forward i have to keep pushing through i've read Almost, I, I'm reading because I want to know. It's not enough. My wife's like, "What is your problem?" Like, I just want to make sure I don't leave anything undone in this life. I want to finish. I want to finish this life with nothing left to have to have deposited, exchanged, or put out there. And so I could I could sit on the platform of okay, I'm going to keep with this faith and this belief, and I'm going to structure my house this way, and I'm going to build it. It's going to be great. And I'm going to I'm going to do my practice here. But what if I meet somebody who's a hardcore, you know, uh, Judaic or Muslim? Like, I want to understand the Muslim faith more. Like, I need to know it more. Why? Because we're all part of it. Ask not for whom the bell tolls. It tolls for thee. If there's an issue in the world, I'm partially responsible for it. We, we need I don't to, care if it, I was just going to say we need to look at this holistically. It's all part of the big picture. Bingo. Bingo. That's exactly it. And So, and, Bill, I wanted yeah. to ask you— um, and, and we're kind of pivoting a little bit uh, about the emotions thing again. Mm. Um, and I, I've noticed uh, in our work, and Jeff and I, again, we've spoken about this many times, is that mischaracterization of what emotions are. Mm. Uh, and living in America for the amount of time that I have, it's very clear. If there's one thing I can say America is good at, at least from a culture <laughs> And marketing media perspective is we we butcher the real meaning and the depth of what things truly are. Yeah. So um, encountering folks who maybe have that, and, and I'll use the example, this is one that we've heard many times, is that I like to, a person will, will be in maybe one of our, our sessions or a one-on-one -on -one coaching and will say, well, I, I try to stay away from those negative emotions. Mm. And we'll kind of like probe a little bit and say, well, okay, or ask the question, well, what, you, what defines for you a negative emotion? Yeah. And they'll say, well, okay, anger, 
You know, I got to really watch. I got to stay away from that because that's that typically causes me problems with my wife, my son, my whatever. Yeah. And it was rooted in how they grew up with the observed yep. from a father totally. or a parent. Right. So they're they're in that mindset that anger is bad because yeah. of what I saw when I was fill in the blank. So can you talk a little bit about that dynamic? Because I would imagine some of this kind of thing comes up in counseling at, at some level, right? Absolutely. And I think anger, I'm so glad you mentioned anger, Eric, because anger is the, one of the greatest forces, if not the greatest force in the universe. And I'm not being pedantic or glib. Anger means we care about something, right? So if you, and, and so, mm. uh, so as Robert Monroe said, Robert Monroe studied out of body experiences that got the Monroe Institute in Virginia. Um, and he studied the human condition as, as intensely and as rigorously as pretty much any human has in the last 50 years. And he said, and he says this quote, he says, there hasn't been an act in human history that wasn't driven by an emotion. Everything we do is driven by an emotion. It's the unexamined self, the unlived life, the unknown emotions that are the kind of the killer of the life flow. And so anger is a great example. When I get angry at my wife, it's typically because she gave me the hairy eyebrow and she made me feel like a 12 year old. <laughs> my 12 year my 12 year old self is a little bit angry at my mom for browbeating my dad. So there's this kind of uh. dynamic loop going on, but anger at her means I care enough about her. I care about myself and I care about my life. Okay. Here's what, here's a powerful thing. I tell this to guys all the time. I said, when your wife, or your girlfriend stops getting angry at you, it's done. It means she stopped caring. Anger means there's something there. It's a signal and it's much, it's much older than the actual issue you're angry at. It looks and smells like you're angry at your mom or your sister, but you're really, anger really is sadness. Anger and sad, the anger sadness paradigm is one of the great unexamined, um, the context of when a woman gets angry, it means somehow she feels that's, that she's not being respected and heard and makes her feel small and young, and she's actually sad. My wife gets, gets really angry when our, one of our three daughters says something to her and makes her feel disrespected. The disrespect makes her feel less than. Her less than makes her feel like a little girl, and her dad was a bit dismissive, a bit of a drinker when she was a kid. So we can go all the way back to the source. And so emotions is, are, is the intelligence of our life. And so they're stored in our belly. We've got the intelligence of the heart. It's the limbic system. It's through the emotional body. And here's the thing. The entrance to that door of self, that emotion, that's the hard part, right? You're going to have a memory. And that's why people avoid it. But if that person, you know, that angry person could slow down, we could close our eyes and we go back to when were you angry? Oh, I was angry in seventh grade because I got dropped like a hot rock. Oh, is that how you feel now? This is this 100 percent of the time I start with a client. I'm like, how do you feel? I feel blah, blah, blah. Great. Close your eyes. How old do you feel as you're in this emotion? I feel 10 years old. Bingo. Hmm. Now we start that work because it's the 10 year old self in the 43 year old body that feels dismissed feels less than it feels insecure it feels scared it feels sad you know what uh, and, bill um i i'm cutting you off a bit I, yes please I, I i just i think about those uh from my own perspective my own life i grew up in a culture where things like therapy psychologist yeah. Yeah. was an absolute no we don't do that totally all right so when I look at some of the trauma that I experienced as a kid uh, and some of it being pretty deep, yep, um, that wasn't even on the table for my parents. <laughs> it was purely not even close, not even, it wasn't even on the radar. And no. it, I mean, I, I grew up poor, so there was no, yeah. it wasn't, it wasn't even an issue about money. It was just like, yep. even if we had the money, we don't yep. do that. We don't do that. So yep. we, I was left to gut it out and figure yep. it out and walk on through. Yep. It wasn't until, oh gosh, 30 years or so later where all of that stuff came to my door and it was kind mm. of like a, Hey, remember us? <laughs> now how old were you oh gosh it, i'd have to be 
close to 47-ish, yep. Yep. 48. Yep. yep. And I will tell you, if it were not for the fact of the wife that I had and my close circle of friends who just treated me with so much grace and mm. mercy, right? I mean, just, Amazing. I mean, I felt like, hey, you guys should be condemning me here. I felt mm. like, oh, you shouldn't be, uh, I mean, look at me. I'm 48 and I'm now going to talk about something that happened 30 years, 40 years ago, whatever. And they didn't. They did not ditch me. They, they looked with compassion um, and non-judgment. And it was in that process that I kind of got to examine those things from those many, many years ago that never got fully addressed, right? And, and, and I think that that, I mean, though I, my experiences will be different than others, I, there's a part of me that I'm, start, I'm, I'm really starting to believe, in, and Bill, because you are in that counseling space, that so much of it is the stuff that culturally the, we were told don't, you don't deal with that. You don't white you, knuckle it. Yeah, yeah. Don't even bother. Figure it out bother. on your own, but don't yep. go there. Is 100%. that, and I guess that I'm going to wrap all my statement yep. and my story with is, are, are you seeing that out there? These 100%. Days? 100%. <laughs> so you and I were raised by the white knuckle it depression era generation that they didn't have time, luxury, whatever you want to call it. Um, and then our generation came around and we were kind of in between that just white knuckle it will sort it out to like, Oh my gosh, this is kind of heavy stuff. I wonder what I'm carrying inside. Um, this next generation, I will tell you, uh, you know, so kids right now between the age of called 23 to 40 ish or, you know, mid thirties, mm -hmm. uh, biophysically, but you know, psycho emotionally, they're, they're, they're built differently. They're, 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 they're coming, you know, they're the next kind of reboot of, of us. So I've got a lot of great, uh, the, the language that these kids are able to use and access and the feelings they're able to access mm -hmm. powerful. I want to go back to your story real quickly. Vulnerability, yep. vitamin V I call it. Vulnerability oh, nice. is like the, is the elixir of life. It's th only through vulnerability. Do we grow and build relationships only grow and build through vulnerability and as you're talking and you are being vulnerable to that friend group your family and friend group naturally mammals have a have an have part of the mammalian dna is an empathy that say reptiles don't have mammals do and so automatically when you become vulnerable eric it enriches and deepens the people around you's life and they get comfortable with their vulnerability so you feel like okay you know you're they're doing so much for you you did a lot for them through your willingness a masculine male willing to be vulnerable is one of the most powerful forces on the planet i always say when a male meditates and starts to and starts to, to weep and cry the universe sh shudders with joy boom, boom. there's a there's an actual sound because the masculine energy needs to understand the feminine the chaos the emotions and so you what you did will change generations. I say the, the name of my book was originally called The Space in Between because we absorb our parents' lives. Mm. And so what I say biomedic biomedically is the only thing I leave my kids, only thing I leave them is my sense of self, the vibration. And so you're changing your vibration, psychomotion, literally the electrons in you biomagnetically is going to change everybody around you. So I say what we do now to self and what we do now in our relationship changes our grandkids, grandkids. It changes who they are going to become because we are changing the magnetic drip of the world around us. And that's the power of emotional intelligence. That's the power of the work that you guys are doing. Well, it's and that is that real. Wow. Um, and uh, Jeff, go ahead and kick me out of the table if I need to stop. But you just really hit on something that... Uh, very recent, right? So um, in the spirit of that vulnerability, my, my son, who is 19 years old, um, he, without embarrassing him, I don't know how often he listens to our podcast, Jeff, but you'll it, find out. I was going to say <laughs> some way, somehow. So I'm going to be, I'm going to show him a great deal of, uh, of, of uh, grace and deafness, uh, if a, I can say it that a way. A new car will make up for it. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right, right. Venmo. Yeah. Venmo. <laughs> Venmo, yeah. <laughs> so um, we, we've had in our relationship uh, in the last year or so, uh, I would say it's been not terrible, but it's been ha it's had its rough spots. And part of it is rooted in him uh, sort of uh, – 
tasting the things that he thinks uh, the world uh, applauds, right? Yeah. Yep. And and the struggle for me internally is it's like I want to say, Grant, don't don't go there because I'm telling you, man, it's fool's gold. I believe me, I've tried. I I've I've experimented too, man, and it does not lead to anything good. And um, you know, of course, because I remember what it was like to be 19. It was kind of like yep. roll of the eyes and just kind of keep on moving, or to kind of placate me a little bit and and kind of use that that technique. So he had something that occurred here about a week or so ago, and um, we got to talking, and he was showing some vulnerability. And I got to tell you, um, I, as a dad, Bill, I have. I, I sometimes have there's what's going on in my head and then what I've got coming out of my, my yeah my mouth and my person, my personality, yeah. right? And th- I'm so thankful for emotional intelligence from a personal perspective uh, because for me, it's that blending of the consequential thinking and optimism and navigating emotions. And those are yeah. competencies in our world. But the, the reality of it is, it's like I'm, there's a part of me ahead going, I don't feel this. I don't feel this. No, I've got to do this. I've got to mm-hmm. connect with him because if I don't connect with him, yeah. there'll be this chasm. But I don't know how, but I don't know. <laughs> I don't feel it. I'm do it anyway, Eric. Just do it anyway. And we got in this conversation this morning and he um, he kind of threw something at me and my bullshit detector came on mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Okay. And I said, okay, Grant, I hear you, man. Uh, you know, I, something to that effect and okay. All right. And, and then he walked away. Mm-hmm. So I'm up, I'm outside and I'm doing a little, uh, uh, labor in the yard, which is great meditation for me. Oh yeah. And, and I'm pulling up these weeds and I'm thinking to myself, did I leave a gap for him? Did I leave a question mark for him? Mm. And I said, I, I got to go in and I got to I got to tell him, keep at it, son. Just keep at it. Wow. Now, beautiful. Right. So I'm thinking to myself, oh. that's really not going to again, Eric in my head going, <laughs> I don't know what difference that's going to make. I don't know. But I got to do it. I got to do it. Yeah. And yeah. his response to me. Thank you so much, dad. Oh, oh. And I'm looking and going, wait a minute. Okay, and then, Bill, just what you were talking about, that shift that happens, that it it just, uh, I I should be brief and say, thank you, Bill. (laughs) Jeff's looking at me. We're going to pivot there. (laughs) And if we have time, we'll come back. It's so good. Oh, Uh, my gosh. We could talk for 20 minutes. Yeah, and I I want to be fair to the audience, and hopefully, audience, you got a lot out of that, too. But, Bill, you mentioned vulnerability and its power. So that leads me to this um, area of those that are out there in our audience that, hey, I want to grow my relationships. I want them to be better. I want them to be healthier. Um, I'm Maybe I'm, am I going taking too much for granted that you would say vulnerability would be one of the top things that you can do in order to strengthen or make your relationships more healthy? And what other things? So the number one thing would be vulnerability. When people ask me, well, Bill, what do you mean by that? I I say to them, you want to deepen your relationship with whoever. Next time you're with them, when if the moment's right, just share something more about yourself. Why? Because it'll be good for you to share. It's good for us to verbalize how we're feeling because stuff comes up in us when we get a chance to verbalize. That's kind of what the therapeutic space is. So we get to share a little bit about yourself and just put it out there into it with a nice space and that other person's either going to grab onto it and take it and deepen and, and share about themselves or they won't. So, so much information will come out if you're willing to be courageous enough to be vulnerable. That to me is the most important thing. So you put a lot of a little bit of vulnerability. Yeah. You know, when I was eight, I really felt like I didn't really know who I was. Oh, really? Me too. Boom. Now the relationship just went to a different layer, whether you know it or not consciously and unconsciously, it went a little bit deeper. Right. So that's number one. Number two is just what I always say. So coming back to the word relationship itself, relatus, it means that you and I are in relationship right now, Eric, we, we, we spend time together, blah, blah, blah. And you and you say something and it kicks up something in me. It isn't about you. It's something got kicked up in me that makes me feel a certain way. So what I say is something gets kicked up in Bill. I take those emotions. I take that feeling, sadness, 
dismissiveness and I go into my meditation and I feel into it and I try to figure out, oh, Eric reminded me of when a teacher says something, blah, 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 whatever. I'm just making it up. Mm -hmm. And so then I, I get that insight. I'm like, oh, that made me feel. And then I carry back that knowledge, that, that, that new piece of insight back to you or back to somebody else. Right. So now we're in a dance. It's a rhythm. It's a motion growing our relationships about understanding me, understanding you, you understand yourself. And then we share some of that information. So really, it's the sharing exercise mm -hmm. that to me is one of the most powerful things to do in the dynamic of relationship. Wow. And um, th those two things is I say, watch the friction. The, the universe, second law of thermodynamics, the universe is based on friction. We can we can avoid it. But it, there's no avoiding it. The second law of thermodynamics says any two objects, objects in the universe are going to be in friction until there's some kind of um, status, some kind of um, um, inertia. Mm -hmm. And so in anything we do, there's going to be friction. People are afraid of the friction. I say turn and face, embrace the friction. What's the friction doing? Oh, it's making me feel less than. It's making me feel anger. Oh, hey, where's that anger from? Ah, oh, there it is. Couldn't find it. Now I got it. Yeah. So turn and face the friction. That guy cut you off. That guy's in his own space. He's he's feeling terrible. He's feeling less than his dad, just blah, 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 whatever. Or he's just a jerk. There's nothing you can do about that. What's it making you feel in you? What's what's it kicking up in you? Oh, you're frustrated because you're going to now get to run late and he's being disrespectful for you and your car. OK, so what kind of weight should I carry or put onto that notion? Right. So it's a constant Oh, there I am again. Up oh, there's little Billy. Up oh, there's twelve year old Billy. Up oh, there's eighteen year old Billy. Up oh, there's you know the shaman Billy. Whatever. There are all these different parts of us. We are not a singular entity. We are made up of all these different parts. There's Eric the the wise father. There's Eric the friend. There's Eric the the great um, spiritualist. There's the uh, rel there's all these different parts. Son, brother. It's all these different parts are being kicked up. All different pieces are being kicked up at different times. Wow. And so just understand what piece is being kicked up right now. Ah. Oh, Bill at 10 years old is being kicked up because my mom just said something really dismissive and really judgmental, and it really made me feel less than. Okay, there you go. Start there. <laughs> Start yeah, the day there right, then. Right, right. right. <laughs> wow. So, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. So, uh, Bill, I, I wanted to take some time uh, to ask you about what are you working on in the current Today. frame that you're really excited <laughs> about? We'd want to yeah. share that with our audience and uh, get a, a view. And I know you touched on some of the things with the writing, yep. but, but what, what's, what's yep. exciting you here recently? The most exciting thing. So, um, you know, I spent whatever, 11 years trying to write the book. It finally came out and really it was just, it's, it's really a collection of insights. I use 67 different sources. I actually quote 60 different, 67 different pieces of whether it's research or other books, because I wanted to, I wanted to universalize this experience of, of waking up and growing up and, and becoming more tuned in and completing one's life. Mm -hmm. And so now we're taking this body of work and we're trying to put it together into a 12 week college level class, a class that could be taught in, in 10th grade or it could be taught in, um, you know, master's programs of, of social work or sociology. Um, again, it's called the history of being human. And the general project is called the intuition project. And it's everything we talk about today. It's purely EQ. It's the, it's, it starts at day one and there's mandatory meditation half an hour a day. And then you're writing on it and you're reading about it and you're reading and writing your own mythology. And you're just, I want to take people through this 12 week journey, which just gives them a foundational background and context to what, what they can take with them for the rest of their lives, right? Imagine you and I, Eric, at 19 and somebody said, you know, we're going to teach you about intuition. We're going to teach you all this context, whether it's religion, and we're going to make you do these exercises. We're going to make you make you do yoga. We're going to make you stretch and breathe. We're going to make you tune in. Think of if we were willing to do that then. Think of how how much we would have taken in earlier than waiting till we were in our 30s, 40s, and 50s to kind of take this knowledge in. So I'm really, I feel like this generation, this next generation is ready for it. You know, the 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds and the 40-year-olds are, they're thirsty. They're such, and COVID was such a, great brutal tragic unfolding and undoing of of the world of the human system mm. and it's really woken people up people really want to go what am i doing with my life where do i turn where do i go and i feel like guys like you and myself and jeff like we gathered this wisdom what do we do with it we're still we're still gathering we'll never stop gathering right when they put that last shovel of dirt on me and hopefully i'm in my mid 80s maybe i make it longer <laughs> who knows yeah could be tonight that last bit right before they do it, I want to go, did I lead anything? 
I did. I, I hope I didn't lead anything. And I want, like, I want to share that energy and intention with others. And that's my project. I, I'm, I'm probably by the end of the year, I'll have a, uh, actually probably by November, I'll have a, a rough outline. I'm going to work with some folks to get it online. And, um, and I've got, I've got friends at pretty, you know, in, in, in colleges and universities that are interested in curriculum. They're interested in content. And oh, I talk to them great. about this content, you know, and it's, it's so that that's what I'm super, super excited about. Well, Bill, I, uh, and Jeff, I'm going to come to you. I, I just want to throw this out and we probably could do a show on it, but, uh, <laughs> I, I hope that you'll pitch this to the business schools. Yes. Because yes. If, oh, there, God. if there is oh, God. if there is a curriculum uh, oh, that is needed in that world, yeah. yep. you just described it. But having said you that, I, let me pivot, Jeff. All right, what you just described, Bill, is something in our um, model of EQ called noble goal. Mm. It's it's what you want people to remember about you <sighs> when. And that is sometimes that. the hardest thing for people to come up with. Uh, a lot of people have it and don't know it. And I wish yeah. everybody that we worked with had it as well defined as you do. Mm. That's so, that's sweet of you to say that. So that's interesting. What, what I like to, I did this presentation to a group of 20, uh, 14 business guys last year. A friend of mine runs EO, um, Entrepreneurs Organization out of Arizona. Mm, yeah. And I started mm-hmm. out, the first five minutes was like, guys, Money's great, all this stuff. What are what are you going to leave here? What I, the, all the ancients, all the gurus, including Christ, all the ancients, they always said, "You want to die wide awake. You want to finish up wide awake. Wide awake means you've cleaned up, you've picked up all the energy of everything that's kind of hasn't been processed, understood, and and lived out. And if you do that, you kind of you kind of expire and meld back into the universe wide awake. So you haven't left." the resentment, the anger, the frustration. I said, guys, you've got the money. You had to make it a million bucks to be in the room. You got everything, but what are you gonna leave here? What are you doing? What are you gonna leave here? Like, it's time to start looking at that. They're like, well, what do we do? I'm like, well, start small, finding out what it is you really want and how you can add to people's psycho-emotional self more, even more so than their material self. Because the material stuff is great. Now that you've built it, now what? So I'm just trying to get them curious, trying to get them to look just a little bit over the veil. But I love it. The noble. Yeah, especially the male. The, the, the men, when we, you know, the Native American cultures, you know, by the 70s, by, by the time it wasn't until you got into your 60s, 70s, 80s and 90s in those cultures. And those ancient cultures, the Aboriginals, they lived a lot longer than the white man thought. They lived a long time. And so you didn't really become an elder till you got to your 70s and 80s because the wisdom of, the, of, the, of, the, of your life, <laughs> that's when you could apply it, right? We're wise now, but if we stay on this game, guys, five years from now, think how much wiser you'll be than right now. Think how much wiser you are now than five years ago. So look at that trajectory. And so I love what you guys are doing. It, it, brings, me, it brings me solace and joy that there's other awakening, awoke, awake men putting the, I call it masculinizing the feminine, <laughs> masculinizing the feminine, concretizing the emotional world into this material world. Wow. That's the game. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we, we appreciate that. Thank you. Seriously. So last question I have for you, Bill, and we're trying to ask this question more and more. What would you whisper in the ear of your younger self? Oh, <laughs> Wow. I'm going to tear up just thinking about it because I spend a lot of time in my inner child. Still, I do a lot of inner child work. It's kind of the basis. Bradshaw's mm-hmm. book, Homecoming, mm-hmm. is really the basis of all my work because I feel like, you know, as Jesus says, only only the only children go to heaven. I believe He's talking about the heart of the child, which lives inside the man. I would whisper, "I'm here. I'm always here. Trust it. Mm. Trust it. Keep pushing, Bill. You know, you're a good kid." Yeah. Keep pushing. That's a beautiful, beautiful question. Thank you for asking that. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. Bill, uh, I tell you what, Jeff, we must be doing really well with our guests because we got to have Bill back. Because yeah. there's still there's still some stuff, man, that I, I want to touch field on. Needs more plowing. Yes, more plowing exactly. Let's we'll, we'll carve out an acre or two here. Please. No, no, five acres for Bill. Five acres. <laughs> right? That's what we got to. I'm keep, in. We got to work I'm this, in, guys. Uh, we I'm can't in. You thank guys you. Are phenomenal. Well, thank you, and and we can't thank you enough for 
carving out some time for us and Please. being on the podcast. And uh, Please. we again, man. we promise we, we look forward to seeing you again. And uh, for those in the audience, uh, we will have things in the show notes around Bill's work and the book and some of the course things that he talked about and how to get a hold of Bill, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> if, if you want to learn more from him directly. And uh, once again, Bill, thanks for being on. And everyone, Thank thanks for guys. tuning in. And we look forward to the next time we're together. Take care. All right, guys. All the best. Hi, everyone. This is Eric Pennington with The Spirit of EQ. I'm not introducing a new episode today. I'm here to tell you some things that might help you. Jeff, you're with me as always. So yes. how do people get in touch with us? Well, the best way is just send us an email at info at spiritofeq.com. That's awesome. Jeff, I was also thinking about reviews, and I'm notoriously bad at asking for them. So reviews on all of the platforms, wherever you get your podcasts, yes. you think that'd be good? I think that would be great because, one, that will help us learn how to make better ones. And it's always good for us. So we're, we're not the perfect podcast host. We're close. Okay. All but, right. But, but not, still, not totally we want perfect. your feedback. We want your feedback. But it'll, it also might uh, let us know a new subject. Hey, we need to dig deeper into that. Yeah. So let us know what you think. Cool. We really appreciate that. As always, too, there is social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, and we also have a YouTube channel. Those also have mechanisms or, or options for you to be able to leave a comment, a like, or those kind of things. Just want to make sure that you know how to get in touch with us. Right, Jeff? Right. We appreciate you all. Thank you.